Welcome back to News Desk. Now we're discussing procurement and supply and supply chain. We have a team from the Kenya Institute of Supplies Management. Thank you so much for making time. I'd like each one of you to introduce themselves and what you do at the Kenya Institute of Supplies Management. Starting with you, sir. Thank you, Noor. My name is Kennedy Awina Riembi. I'm a supply chain practitioner working at KEFIS, but I also work at Kenya Institute of Supplies Management as mm -hmm. a member of the Professional Standards Committee, which largely uh, designs and prepares programs for training mm -hmm. for supply chain practitioners in the country. Right. What Thank about you? you? Thank you. My name is Marianne Karanja. Mm -hmm. I'm a proud member of KISM. I'm also a fellow of the Institute of um, Purchasing and Supply in the UK, where I'm a fellow. Um, during the day, I work for Safaricom, where I head supply chain, right. um, but I'm also an aspiring council member in the elections that will be conducted in January. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Noor. My name is Wilfred Maloba, Deputy Supply Chain Manager in Nairobi Water Company. Right. I'm also an aspiring council member in the forthcoming general elections, and I'm here to articulate supply chain issues in relation to the elections. Right. I just want us now to just talk briefly about procurement. I mean, we always hear procurement, supply chain. Mm -hmm. Just give us a brief about, you know, what's the history and the structure uh, and the application on the basis of public procurement in Kenya. If I could start with you, Maloba. Thank you. Uh, supply chain, or rather procurement in Kenya, has come a long way from the colonial <coughs> days. And I've written something on the same but I will go direct to where the rubber met the road. Right. 2005 was a milestone in supply chain profession where Kenyan parliament enacted the laws mm -hmm. controlling procurement in the country. Previously, we had colonial area buying. It was not referred to as procurement. It was buying, storage, and issuing. But 2005, the act gave impetus to this profession. It was followed by 2006, we got regulations, Public Procurement and Asset Regulations Act 2006. Mm -hmm. Now, the two laws were governing procurement. We didn't have a law governing professionals, the practitioners like us. 2007, we had Supplies Practitioners Management Act 2007 mm -hmm. that guided the practitioners how we are conducting our business in this profession of supply chain. What are our interests? What is our input? What is our code of <coughs> conduct? Mm -hmm. Another milestone was 2010. Now procurement was anchored on the 2010 constitution, Article 227. It now gave us a strategic function in institutions because previously procurement was like a department, a support section with no law anchored well in the way we relate with the CEOs, accounting officers. Mm -hmm. 2010 constitution gave us a more highlight on efficiency, economic, uh, economical, cost benefit, value for money, procurement, and transparency. From that 20, 2010 constitution, we had Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act 2015. This is the act that now emanated from the constitution, powers enacted in the constitution. And we have since had another amendment, a regulation, 2020, towards the same effect to give, comply to the constitutional requirements of this procurement. Mm -hmm. And today, we as a supply chain uh, management professionals, practitioners, we are a strategic function right. in the procurement field. Right. Thank you for that. Of course, you've just given us a sort of a chronological history of procurement. I want to come to you, Ariambi. Um, yes, you are representing the Kenya Institute of Supplies Management. Give us a bit of details, what it is about the structure and functions for this body. No, thank you. Thank you, Noor. Now, the KISM is the Kenya Institute of Supplies Management which, like my brother said, it was established in the year 2007 through this SPMA Act, that is the Supplies uh, Protectionist Management Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, largely it was meant to, to provide training, uh, register and regulate practitioners in the country. That include both public and private sector practitioners. Now, it was also uh, given the mandate of uh, further training uh, the members that is through continuous professional developments and also developing standards of supply chain uh, management in the country. Now you realize that uh, the structure of the institute it is designed where it has a council. That council is comprised of uh, seven elected members 
uh, that is including a chair and six council members and then it also has uh, the director general of the PPRA, a representative mm -hmm. and also a representative from the national treasury because KSM is a government entity and it runs uh, it's squarely under the national treasury so like my two colleagues have mentioned they are aspirants for the next three years where we have elections for our council members mm -hmm. and the members are expected to carry out uh, their democratic right in mm -hmm. electing their leaders who will spare the profession ahead in the next three years so then my question would be um if i am interested to join um how can i join and what are the benefits really for me to join this body Thank you. KSM, uh, like any other professional body, uh, there is the academic and professional qualification that one is supposed to be having. Mm -hmm. Section 16 of the Act provides that one who has a certificate, a diploma or a degree can be registered. However, we can mention that uh, we are currently having uh, some legal uh, changes and amendments so that we come with a new bill which actually currently is at National Treasury, mm -hmm. where we are going to have members to go through the Certified Procurement and Supply Chain Professional course for them to be actually registered. Once you've done your academic qualifications, mm -hmm. then you will move to the professional qualification for you to actually be registered. Now, as a member, the Institute gives you a membership number and a license for you to practice. Now, that is one of the biggest benefits for you to actually practice. You realize that uh, Section 30 prohibits someone to practice as a supply chain practitioner in this country without a license and a membership. And maybe we'll also ask if you have a procurement department <laughs> and if that <laughs> member is actually registered with us. That is what the law provides. So uh, the first benefit is one, the institute will give you that mandate to actually practice in the country. Two, the institute will also continuously train you and give you, uh, give, provide you with the current trends in the, in the market so that you can have more efficiency in whichever place you're operating in. Thank you. Right. Um, you know, there, of course, um, even when someone goes to campus, you hear someone is doing procurement. And there are a lot of people who are practicing it, of course, without proper credentials. Mm -hmm. So what's your take, Marianne, on it when, with people who are practicing, but they don't have the proper credentials to handle the procurement functions? So there's two ways I see this. Um, so number one is from a practicing standpoint, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. It is not acceptable to have people who are not qualified in procurement functions. It is similar to having anybody or Marianne coming to attend to you when you go to Nairobi Hospital and she's not a qualified doctor, you know, to be able to diagnose your, your situation. So I'd say for procurement, it's important to have certified professionals, people who've been trained, people who've been licensed, people who've been licensed to give an opinion in supply chain matters. And why? because not everyone is an expert in the field. But number two, there are critical decisions around integrity, governance of a process, and the fiduciary responsibility for taking care of government expenditure or the organization's expenditure that need to rest on someone who has been trained and certified to do that. Now coming to where we have people who are already practicing and do not have the certification. I think the Institute KISM has tried to lobby, has tried to engage with them to get them to understand what benefits they stand to gain from by joining the Institute, from getting training and being professional in the way they undertake their, their duties. So it is important that they come on board. They stick to, if they really want to continue to practice, that they seek training, that they join KISM, so that they can also be supported in that process going forward. I just want to understand, one, though, like, if you can two, point one, out, two, what one, are the one, risks two. if someone doesn't actually have the credentials uh, for, like, procurement training? What are the risks that can happen? If I could ask. I think it's a myriad of risks. So, right. one, you'll end up with uh, maybe an honorable expenditure. Mm -hmm. You could end up with purchasing the wrong items. You could end up with uh, governance issues in the process. So where you have um, bidders who come in to present their bids after the process had, has already been concluded, mm -hmm. which creates a very fertile platform for, for lawsuits, litigation, etc. So the organization um, basically is exposed legally, commercially, um, and ethically when you have people who are not certified or competent to execute mm -hmm. that job. Maybe yeah. just to add, to add, yeah. If you look at uh, the SPMA just, just, uh, Act. I think 
think we're going to continue with this conversation in a bit. We just need to take a short commercial break. We'll be back with more.